Association regular business. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Webster Board of Education regular business meeting and workshop meeting. Would you all please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. And before we get underway with the business of the district, we do have a brief statement to make. Um, at this meeting, we have community members who would like to address the board and we welcome their participation. Visitor speaking time is three minutes long and community members wishing to speak can request time from board clerk, Cindy Cushman, and they will receive a Zoom link. We have three individuals who have requested speaking time this evening, and they are Tara Yarovitz and Michelle and Joe Barbero, and we welcome them. Before we begin, however, we would like to reiterate the district's position on reopening schools. As your Board of Education, it is important that we continue to stress that we support a return to school when it is deemed safe by the governmental agencies whose guidelines we must adhere to. The criteria and agencies that are responsible for issuing guidance have not changed. We still need to abide by six foot social distancing, wearing masks, and ensuring staff has access to any federally approved vaccine. <clears throat> Some districts have the ability to work around these guidelines, but because of the size of our district, we do not. Classroom space and transportation guidelines are significant barriers. Recent media attention claims school are open, but is only within these guidelines. There are no exemptions to the governor's executive orders. The reason schools are safe is because we have enforced these guidelines. We join our colleagues across the county in advocating for a safe reopening of schools. In order to do so, many districts are requesting that the criteria be developed and is equitable and based on the safety of students and staff. Until the governor, the SED, CDC, and New York State Department of Health and Monroe County Department of Health change or revise the current metrics, we will continue instruction as is. These are the same entities who recommended the closure of schools and who are responsible for issuing guidance with the New York State Department of Health having the ultimate authority. Since the onset of the pandemic, our district leadership has worked closely with other Monroe County superintendents and Dr. Mendoza of the Monroe County Health Department. We will continue to do so. And with that, we will continue with the, with the visitors speaking time and those who wish to speak this evening, please announce your name first and you may begin at any time. Hi, this is Joe and Michelle Barbaro. Welcome. Hi. So, and I, we completely understand what everything you just said, but at, um, at the same time, just like everything, this is a fluid and everything has been changing rapidly. And the government and Cuomo, which whatever he says shouldn't even apply, but they lifted the six foot rule for sports. Right now, my son is currently on a field, an indoor field with 30 players playing soccer. And you cannot play soccer six feet apart. Um, you could be on top of each other wrestling and of course not six feet apart. I think everybody in this district is sit, has been sitting at a restaurant without a mask on and being served by a waiter or a waitress. And again, everything has been pretty safe. So to say that students need to be six feet apart, sitting at a desk with a mask on, with a teacher with a mask on, I, I, I just don't understand. The education level that the kids are receiving is ridiculous. My kids are saying that they feel like they're on the school bus longer than they are in school. Yeah, and as an educator myself, I'm a teacher. I have students who are, I'm teaching with um, them seven hours a day. They're six feet apart with masks on and everything has been fine. 
my class, my students have been fine. We haven't had any issues. Um, everyone's following the rules and they're getting the education that they deserve and need as our kids do as well. So it's definitely heartbreaking seeing, especially our child is an on an, an IP and, and you know, she needs that extra, you know, reinforcement and skills and, 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 and she's not getting that. And, and we're seeing that when she comes on and she gives us her work, it's not where she should be. And it's very heartbreaking. She's two grade levels in our eyes back from where she should be. And you make so much progress. And then to get all that taken away, it's, it's, it's not right. So it's not I'm, acceptable. For sports being a choice, um, I understand that. You know, they were saying that it's a choice for parents. Well, it's also a choice for parents should allow their kids to go to school. Full so time. if it's our choice to take that risk for them to go to school full time, to get the education that they deserve, we're willing to do that. I mean, we're playing travel soccer. We were in Brighton, we're in Penfield, we're in Fairport with different kids in different communities. And I just don't understand how this is acceptable. They, they can't be sitting at a desk together in a classroom getting an education that they deserve. And quite frankly, that we're paying for and not getting any anything in return. And for teachers that aren't vaccinated, well, you could be vaccinated by now. And to say, well, it's not safe for teachers, well, that's also an insult to every nurse, doctor, frontline worker that's been dealing with this for the last year with no vaccination. Mm -hmm. to, to, so if that is going to be a talking point and that's going to be a concern, that's out the door. Because that's just insulting everybody that's been working for over a year, business owner, restaurant, nurse, doctor, with no vaccination. So... So anyway, so we're seeing other districts seven. that are opening their schools. Some, you know, our nieces are going to school full time in Scania Atlas, and we understand. And it's a public school. Yeah. It's not a private school. Yeah. And, and yes, education. we are looking at private schools. Yeah. We're currently enrolling in many because of what Webster School District has done. It's it's not acceptable. Yeah. But even so, having the two hours of school and then coming home, my kids are maybe working for an hour when they get home. They're done by twelve. They're bored. They're not getting the hours that they need. So I'm I teach over Zoom as well. My school is known for that. One School Global, we teach, and well, I, I'm um, Carmen, I'm sure you've heard of One School Global, but um, we're well known across the country of teaching over Zoom and in person, and it is feasible, it's doable. The teachers should be teaching more over Zoom in front of our children and giving them more education than for two hours a day. Um, there, we could do something. There's other things we can do, and, and I don't see anybody looking further into it. Um, we're just sticking with what, what we're seeing. and It's been over a year, and yeah. this, the education is, is nowhere where it needs to be. Right. I think that's, that's all I have to say. Uh, yeah. Let's Thank go. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you both. We appreciate hearing from you. Have a good evening. Thank you. And do we have Tara? Would you like to... Yep. Please say your name and, and continue. Yeah. yeah, so my name is Tara Yarovitz. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I wrote a more of a letter just so I could gather my thoughts, but um, I'm a mom to an eighth grader at Willink. I'm also a registered nurse in the community. I'm speaking tonight because I am very concerned over where we stand in regards to reopening our schools for full-time in-person learning. As a mom, I have seen what this past year has done to my once outgoing, social, and free-spirited child. She has struggled with feeling isolated, angry, hopeless, depressed, and has lost interest in school. She told me that no one talks anymore at school. There's no eye contact amongst her peers, teachers, no smiles, and everyone seems to be on edge. The once feeling of being safe and at home in school is no more. In March of last year, my child's world came crashing down, much like many of our other kids, and the feeling of hope has been lost. She is receiving a subpar education and it is totally unacceptable. Keeping her engaged on virtual Wednesdays is a constant struggle. The school system is failing our children. We have a mental health crisis with our kids and no one is talking about it. When do these kids become a priority? It's been clear after this week's Mount Monroe County Legislator meeting that there is even more confusion as to who is the one responsible for making the decision to reopen fully. 
Dr. Mendoza says that he has zero authority and the decision is solely up to the superintendents and the Board of Education. The CDC has stated teachers do not need to be fully vaccinated to return to in-person learning. It's time to put our children's mental health needs as the same priority as their, their physical health needs. It is time to step up and do what is right for your students and our children. If we can have kids wrestling on a mat together, then we can sure get these kids back in school full time. The data has proven that schools are the safest place for our kids to be. It's time to give these kids what they desperately need and they deserve. You have been all elected to be the voice of our students and parents. It's time to advocate for our children and open schools for full-time in-person learning now. And I know after our previous speaker just spoke, he talked about nurses. I'm a lifetime health nurse. So I'm in homes with COVID positive patients on a daily basis. And he's right. You know, I've been going into these homes and, and taking care of people. And, you know, we have kids playing sports and, and, and spending time together and we can allow all these things, but they're not safe to sit at a desk and learn, but we can have kids on top of each other on a mat wrestling. It just, it doesn't make any sense. And there's a lot of fingers pointing as to who's responsible and it's time somebody needs to step up and, and how about writing a letter and, and approaching the governor and saying, can we relax some of these rules? Because this is a year and anybody that knows my daughter, <laughs> She's extremely outgoing and we've had to seek mental health. It's, you know, it's, we had to find something that saved her and she's a, she's a performing arts kid. And so yeah, March came and her world literally was stripped down to nothing. And um, seeing her kind of crumble has been extremely heartbreaking. And I understand that there's rules and, and all this stuff, but at some point somebody has to step up and say, you know, and advocate for these kids and say, what can we do? Can, what, can we change the rules? You know, other school districts are doing it um, and they've relaxed some of the social distancing uh, distance together to three feet. So somewhere somebody's allowing this to happen. So has anybody thought about writing to the governor or contacting the governor, his office and seeing if these things can actually happen? Or are we just sitting and waiting for him to announce it? It's just as a parent and as a nurse, like it's heartbreaking to see um, to see your kids, their personalities alter and they're suffering and nobody's talking about it. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this evening. We appreciate hearing from our parents. We really do. And we know that there's a very high level of frustration and our concern has always been and will always continue to be in the best interest of all 8,400 students. So um, we're all trying to get through this as best we can. We, we wish you well, and we thank you very much for speaking with us this evening. Um, We'll continue with the business portion of our meeting and you're, you're welcome to follow up if, if you choose to do so. Thank you all. Next, um, moving into regular business, the December 2020 Treasurer's Report. Brian, if you would please walk us through that. You're muted. Yep, I was talking to myself. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Thank what you. the other guy said when he was on mute. Um, so, uh, end of the federal fiscal year, December 31st, at the exact halfway point of our fiscal year. Uh, so, tax revenue is done. Uh, you'll see probably in April, maybe May uh, is when the county hands over to us the rest of collections. You know, so for December, not a lot happening on the revenue side, minimal state aid, minimal other revenues that, you know, the revenues you're seeing are pretty much aquatics, uh, the usage of uh, memberships coming in, uh, using the facility there. Um, 
we did get our first reimbursement payment on the school lunch side for that month. Uh, it actually for the months of September and October arrived right on December 1st. Uh, so there was a little delay when we sent the school lunch claims in. And uh, so we received that finally. Uh, UPK grant money arrived in December. First payment is actually reduced at, by the 20% for that month. And just in the, in none of our grants uh, in December were approved yet. So all you're seeing is in the special aid fund, uh, wonder care registrations and um, some of the community ed programs that are run through there. Uh, other than that, cash flow is at very high levels. Uh, we're investing about $72 million at this time. Um, you know, rates are, are just are not great and they've actually continued to go down. You'll see that in the coming months when you see the January and February treasures report. Uh, the rates you're looking at now have actually changed even more, um, not uh, in a positive manner, but coming down closer to zero rather than going up. Um, so. You know, you can see that and, you know, you notice the school lunch, the one claim compared to what actually happened in the summer, showing they're actually back in the black um, when you isolate expenses to uh, revenues on a month to month basis. Um, Mike, I know you had a question I saw in my, uh, finally got my email up and working. Um, every month is a little different. So in January, um, you know, December, we only uh, had $2 million in revenue. Well, actually, in January, we'll get all of our star payment money. So there's a $10 million influx of revenue compared to the expenses will stay relatively the same. So the cash flow is the best uh, part of the treasurer's report for you to notice and take a look at uh, to see where we're, how much money month to month we are kind of uh, uh, fluctuating and compared to the different funds, because there's always funds borrowing against each other, especially in the first half of the year. Um, so the cash flow is the best indicator of, of what's happening. So in January, we'll, pro we'll end up with a, uh, you know, a positive cash flow balance on that month to month. March, we get a large state aid payment. So you'll see additional you know, positive revenue there. So it, it fluctuates um, between the months with the lowest being in the summertime, if that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thanks, Brian. And then as we, you know, progress with this new treasurer's report style, you know, next year, next December, it, it's, they roughly follow the same pattern every year with some, some anomalies depending on construction and capital projects, but you'll see the same pattern of cash flow year after year and consistency. Any further questions or comments about the treasurer's report? Can we have a motion then to accept the treasurer's report as presented? So moved. Linda Perfect. and a second by Mike Alt. All in favor? Uh, thank you, motion carries. Moving on to the consent agenda, we have a personnel action. Everyone has had a chance to review. Um, can we have a motion please to accept the consent agenda? I'll make that motion. Sue, in a second. <clears throat> Was by Maria. Sorry. That's okay. It's hard when I can't see everyone. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. That actually concludes the business portion of our meeting. Actually, um, Tammy? Yes. We have a first read for oh. policy 3010. How did that happen, Sue? I don't know how you could possibly forget I, I, policy. <laughs> I do not have an updated copy here in front of me. But I noticed the changes to the policy. Um, and so this would be a first read. Would you like to speak to that, please? Sure. Um, this is part of our regular review. We're reviewing the human or the um, HR portion of the policy manual this, this year. Um, so for policy 3010, really it's a pretty minor change, but we thought it was an important one. And it's, you know, it's a continual cleanup and um, for some of these policies, and of course some of it's new, but in this particular one, um, it started off with the board's specific role is to deliberate. We just wanted to make sure that people understood stood that um, the board 
has other specific roles, other roles besides um, deliberating and establishing policies. So we like we wanted to start it out with one of the primary roles of the Board of Education, just so that was a little more clear. And that's the extent of the revisions that we're suggesting at this time. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, any questions about those revisions? So we will revisit that for a second read. Well, I think we need to vote on a first read. It, it's a, okay. Can we have a motion please to accept the first read of policy 3010? So moved. Saf in a second. Maria. Maria. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And all in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. With that, we will move on to the workshop portion of the meeting. So that concludes the business portion of, of this evening's meeting. And we will move into workshop session.